We thought we knew which striking method was number one for lighting uncharred plant tinder with flint and steel. Well, the method we once called number one has now been bumped to second place by our new flint and steel method that we discovered. But this doesn't mean we're just going to throw out the other methods. In fact, we're going to go ahead and count down our top five flint and steel fire methods for lighting uncharred tinder, finishing with the new first place winner. I'm Luke, this is Wilderness Strong. If you love bushcraft, fire making, ethnobotany, and wilderness survival, make sure you're subscribed with notifications on because we've got unlimited content coming your way. Now, as you may know, we have become obsessed with lighting uncharred natural tinder with flint and steel. Why? Well, until recently, we, like most others in our field, had just resigned to the fact that to be successful with flint and steel fire making, you had to have charred tinder. Or in other words, you had to make a fire so you could make a fire. Well, that always bothered us until one day, one plant and one successful experiment changed the flint and steel fire making game for us forever. And now we cannot stop the pursuit to find as many common successful uncharred plant tenders as possible. But it took us tens of thousands of unsuccessful strike attempts on over 130 variations of plants to become proficient at lighting uncharred tinder. And it's a whole different ball game than using charred material. You have to know which plants to use, which part of the plant to use, what season that plant can be used, and how to process that plant. And you gotta have a realistic expectation for how flammable that plant is gonna be and how long it might take to ignite it. Well, all of this experimenting gave us quite a bit of practice when it comes to producing spark with flint and steel. So here you go, as promised, our top five flint and steel methods and techniques that we use for lighting uncharred tinder. And we can't wait to show you number one. Starting with number five, and that's hitting the flint with the striker from above. Now this is the most common method we see people use and have successfully used ourselves. But even after repeated successes in our videos of doing it like this, we still have people tell us that we shouldn't do it this way because it sends the sparks up instead of down into the tinder. Well, that's only partly true. You can clearly see that the sparks do fly up, but they also fly down, sometimes in great quantity. So we would never say that this method doesn't work, especially considering how many successes we've experienced doing it this way. But many of the uncharred tinder on our success list did not work with this method, possibly because as the sparks fall through the air and root to the tinder, they may be losing heat, decreasing the chances of holding and forming an ember once they land. On to number four, which is putting the tinder on top of the flint. Now, this is similar to how we used to hold our char cloth. Not only will it catch sparks that are flying upward, but it also dramatically shortens the air time and traveling distance of the sparks. But this method also has its drawbacks. First of all, it obviously can't catch the sparks that fly down. But even more significant, is that this method only works if you have fibrous tinder like stinging nettle that'll hold together on top of the flint. If you have a powdery particle type of tinder, it'll quickly get knocked off of your flint after only a strike or two. To remedy these two drawbacks, we'll often put our particle tinder inside a nest like cedar or stinging nettle. And as far as catching the stray sparks that fly down, we've had some fun placing tinder underneath us and trying to guess which tinder will ignite first. In this case, our great burdock tinder caught below us before our stinging nettle could catch a spark on top of the flint. Now we just call number three the flint sandwich, and that's for obvious reasons. And this method was born from our attempt to catch as many sparks as possible without them having to fall too far through the air. You can see it has all the advantages of the last method, but it's greatly improved in its ability to catch sparks as it involves tinder on both sides of the flint catching sparks that fly in both directions. Now it still has the same drawback regarding powdery tinder as it can only be done with specific fibrous tinder that holds together well. But again, this could be remedied by placing your particle tinder inside a nest that's more stable. Now our number two method will never go out of style with us. It held the number one spot for so long and it really deserves some spotlight here. In fact, it is not an overstatement to say that most of our discoveries and successful experiments we've had lighting uncharred tinder can be credited to the repeated use of this method, which is striking the striker, which is held firmly at an angle in the tinder. What's really interesting about this method is that it typically doesn't produce as much quantity of spark, but the spark that it does produce 
seems more adept at creating sparks that hold inside our tinder and progress into embers, oftentimes in five strikes or less. With all the great success this method has given us, it's hard to believe we found something that could beat it. But we did, and here's the new number one. This is the actual footage of us discovering our new favorite method. We were working on a brand new uncharred tinder, and it was definitely more stubborn than many others we've had success with recently. So we were going through just about every method we knew of. We started using the angle striker method, then we switched to the classic from above method. We put the tinder on the rock, we did the flint sandwich, and we couldn't get this tinder to go. Then as we switched back to striking the flint from above, you can see how he's trying to get the flint as low to the ground as possible so the sparks will drop straight onto the tinder. At this point, his knuckles are even firm on the ground. And as soon as that happened, you can see the major increase in spark. Then we decided to just go ahead and put the flint right on the ground and flick across it using a pinch grip with a more rounded striking motion. And with the tinder all around to catch the sparks, it was just a matter of time. So in summary, when using this new method, the flint is firm, which creates more spark. The flint can be easily surrounded by all tinder types to catch spark from all angles. The spark is presumably hotter as it isn't falling from way up above. And the flint placement allows for pinch grip rounded wrist action flicks, which produce more spark. You know, after hearing our whole lives that we had to have charred material to make a flint and steel fire, we were pretty excited last year to discover three common plants that can reliably hold a spark from a flint and steel uncharred. Pacific water leaf, great burdock, and stinging nettle. Well, it turned out that we had just barely uncovered the tip of the iceberg, and we've now discovered so many successful plants that we'll have to break this new information up into more than one future video. So if you love flint and steel fire making, make sure you're subscribed with notifications on because you do not want to miss what's coming up. Thanks for watching.